Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's workshop. Super excited to have you today. We have got a group of great panelists uh, with us that are going to be able to provide you all the inside scoops and inside information um, and, you know, answer all the questions that we've seen commonly come in to help you on your journey and finding your next career. So if you have any questions or there's something you want to ask our panelists, feel free to throw it in the chat as we go. Uh, we want to hear from you, right? And now is a perfect opportunity to ask our subject matter experts out there, you know, what their thoughts are, if you have any questions, if anything comes up or there's something that you want to know, throw it in the chat. They're super willing to help and provide you information. Um, again, really excited to have you guys here today. Thanks for joining us. If you have not done so already, we're going to put a link in the chat um, to go ahead and get registered for our upcoming career fair where you will find some of our deemed colleagues who will be on the panel today, as well as some additional employers. Um, on the registration page, you'll be able to see the different employers that will be attending um, and, you know, decide to engage with some of their jobs that they have available on the job board as well. So without further ado, we can go ahead and get started. I'll introduce our panelists and, uh, you know, let them talk about, you know, what it is they do with their company and their role within the organization so that you guys can get more familiar with them. Um, so we have Josh Santiago on the call today from Suburban Propane, and he is the Senior Military Talent Acquisition Manager, or partner, I'm sorry, um, with Suburban Propane. Alex, if you could tell us, or I'm sorry, Josh, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Sorry, I'm, I can't talk today, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> all good, all good. Uh, so yes, my, my name's Josh. Uh, I was an 11-year active duty uh, veteran of the United States Army. Um, I came straight from recruiting in the Army to becoming a talent acquisition partner here with Suburban Propane. Um, and I also am involved with our Heroes Hired Here program, which is our veteran outreach program, uh, all diversity inclusion um, program that, that I help uh, as well as with my, my partner, Lisa Vault. But I'm excited to be here first panel. So thank you. Nice. It's great to have you. And I love that you're a Yankees fan. So check. <laughs> and then we have Alice Willis. Alice from Laidos. He has joined us quite a few times and he has been, you know, to have on the panel, happy to answer any questions and a wealth of knowledge. Um, Alex, you are the account acquisition program manager for Lighthouse, correct? If you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your role. Yeah, thank you very much, Kayla, and thanks for having me here today. Um, so I am Alex Verholz. Uh, I work here at Lighthouse. Uh, I am the Talent Acquisition Military Program Manager here at Lighthouse. Um, so essentially work within our like corporate side of talent acquisition, where we house uh, all of our programs that relate to everything from military to uh, diversity and inclusion, um, college recruiting, um, kind of what we do from an overall standpoint as far as like the processes and the, um, the tools that we use um, from a recruiting perspective. Um, and then we essentially align to four main groups within the organization um, and our recruiters support various programs and positions across all those groups. Um, but I've been with Lidos for over a decade. Um, so I've seen the company you know, basically go through a number of changes to include a, a rename and a rebrand. Um, very happy to be here to, to answer questions and to provide some insight kind of on the government contracting side of things and, and some best practices. Um, you know, it's not a one size all, not one size fits all approach, um, but just kind of from a, a large defense and government contracting landscape, some of the tools and the, and the tactics that you can use to better position yourself in your job search. Um, so very happy to be here and thank you again for having me. Alex, it is always a pleasure to have you. And then we have Keith who is from CISA and Keith brings us a really unique perspective because he is coming from a federal agency um, where the process to get hired uh, anywhere in government is a lot different. <laughs> and there's quite a few uh, different pathways, I guess you would say, right, um, that you would have to take uh, to kind of acquire some of those positions. So it's great to have Keith here with us on the panel today. Keith, if you could tell us about yourself and your role within CISA. Sure. So, um, yeah, so first off, go Mets. Um, so secondly, uh, yeah, my name's Keith. Uh, I'm a 22 year, uh, army veteran. Uh, he's over. Yeah. <laughs> showing the colors, showing the stripes. Um, yeah, we're a hot mess this year anyway, but anyway, so now I'm digressing. So yeah, Keith's a 22 year, uh, retired army veteran. 
um, with the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which is a mouthful. So we just say CISA for short. Um, and yeah, uh, actually, the last time I was on one of these panels, I was an employee of CISA and just a veteran mentor on the side. Well, now I am a full-fledged recruiter for CISA, specifically a veteran recruiter for CISA. Uh, I wear a couple other hats in my new role as well, but that's that's why I'm here today. So today I am here in that capacity. Um, yeah, and we are a federal agency. We are charged with uh, safeguarding uh, both our cybersecurity as well as any other uh, critical infrastructures within the country, like our power grids, dams, those kinds of things, you name it. Um, phenomenal organization to work for. But yeah, uh, I'll be coming from the angle of recruiter today and happy to assist and answer any questions that I can uh, on how folks can better their uh, uh, chances, if you will, to uh, seek federal employment. Nice. Congrats, Keith. That's a super exciting. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's awesome. All right. So I have a question for everybody on the panel today. Um, and this is kind of, if you, whoever wants to jump in first, go for it. Um, but we would love to know what are some of the hottest jobs for service members and spouses at your company? So and I'll jump at once. I'll go. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. So CISA, uh, you know, the hottest jobs are are all of them. Like so, <laughs> so um, probably the hottest ones for veterans are our special hiring authorities, which we have a lot of. We do a lot of special hiring authorities um, for for our open positions, uh, where any service member that is thirty percent. Uh, VA disabled or more uh, can qualify for, uh, and that's what's called non-competitive. So essentially you are not having to compete against the masses, if you will, that, that type of a role. Um, it is open to any veteran with 30% or more VA disability, but that kind of, you know, it, it shortens down the the the, uh, the candidate pool, if you will. Um, and there's also a Schedule A, so civilians can also be hired under that authority if they have a Schedule A disability. Um, but that's probably our biggest one. Um, we also have, uh, you know, opportunities to hire military spouses directly. Um, you know, but yeah, ultimately, you know, the, the, the hottest jobs are Mostly those, uh, if, if anybody, I can type her name into the chat uh, a little bit later, but Sasha Sardi Wade, she's our social media recruiter. So she's the one posting all those on LinkedIn. Uh, so, if people, you know, I encourage people to always follow her because um, even though I might be, you know, helping to, to recruit and stuff like that, she's the one that posts the job announcements. Um, so, yeah. And then, of course, a lot of our jobs are remote, which is also that's 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 the hot ticket item in, in today's world. So. Uh, to Keith's point, uh, I would say all of our jobs are the hottest jobs, you know, suburban propane, we supply heating uh, to people's homes, businesses. Uh, but uh, as far as like hiring all year round, I would say our drivers and technicians. Uh, one thing that I focus on, um, I cover all of the West Coast, Texas and the New England area. Um, but I, I definitely focus on veteran hiring as well. Um, we hire everyone, but pretty much everyone who comes out of the military has a military driver's license. So if you're interested in driving, continue driving, if you're in a mechanical field, our service technicians, uh, anyone with any type of mechanical uh, ability, if you have that military driver's license when you come out, uh, they just changed the form this year, but generally throughout every state in the country, you can go to your local DMV um, and you fill out one form um, and then you can take the driver's test uh, without having to you know, go through all the, the extra hoops. It's kind of like you go, you take the test, you get your CDL. And then um, that's one of our main, you know, our really our only requirements for our drivers is CDL with the hazmat tanker endorsement, which we, we assist with all that as well. So uh, hottest jobs, I would say service sex drivers, because, you know, we're heating people's homes all year. Yeah, and um, so with us, uh, there is uh, a couple places that I would recommend. Um, so on our career site, which I included the link uh, to in, um, in the chat area, we actually have a subsection um, or a section on top that uh, says hot jobs would be in the upper right hand corner that you can click on. Um, so if you click on that, you can find uh, all of the opportunities that are kind of designated as hot jobs across the organization. Um, these usually equate to some around like 80 to 100 because they're supposed to be about 20 to 25 per group. Um, and they're supposed to be kind of kept up to date. Um, so that's one avenue you can go in um, from kind of just like a broader perspective from Lidos and from, you know, just government contracting and, and kind of what I've seen in the industry. Um, I think this is probably not going to be like new news to anybody, 
but um, skills in cybersecurity and information security, information technology um, are always going to be kind of at, at, at the top uh, of the list there. Um, across all of our different um, kind of business groups within the company, um, and that's work supporting defense, healthcare, intelligence, and the federal civilian market, uh, you do see, you know, IT support, IT services, uh, cyber information security, information assurance type of uh, roles um, really across all of our different um, federal government customers and in a variety of different clearance levels. You know, everything from having a, a, a full scope polygraph supporting the intelligence community to having like a public trust clearance uh, or designation and supporting like say um, the Federal Aviation Administration or, or working on like supporting Department of Energy. Um, so, and kind of all points in between. Um, so really cyber IT, certainly kind of at the forefront there, um, but from uh, specific to, to Lido's perspective, I do recommend taking a look at that hot job section because uh, we have put a lot of time and energy and effort within talent acquisition here at Lidos and making sure that that's like kept up. Um, and, it, and it's not just something where positions just go there and then, you know, stay there for a long period of time. They're, they're very much um, like quick sort of, uh, you know, need to fill, quick to fill type roles. Um, so you can rest assured at the very least that those opportunities are going to be ones that are being, you know, highly scrutinized, right? Um, you know, and, and reviewed uh, on a daily basis. Um, so a couple, uh, couple suggestions there. Nice. Thank you, Alex. So I have another round robin question for all of you. Um, we, you know, sometimes have a lot of people who are unfamiliar with the recruiting process, right, or how it works, or how to even get hired within an organization. I know it can be different uh, depending on if you're a federal agency or the industry that you're in or even just the company that you're with. Um, so if you could just give us a little bit of background on, you know, what does the recruiting and hiring process look like in your organization? And, you know, what are some tips and tricks to help avoid some of the pitfalls, like the dreaded, you know, emails that you get <laughs> that are from an automated bot that says, sorry, we moved on. Um, and, and how do we get past that, right? Like, how does this process truly work? And I think we can start with Keith, because you might have a little bit different perspective than Josh and Alex, um, because you are federal. So we'll start, we'll start with Keith. Sure. So really, the, the best way to, to to be competitive for a job, and I might be stealing thunder from the other two gentlemen, is to network. Uh, even in the federal government, like if you can network your way in an organization. So, you know, statistics show, you know, 70 to 85 percent, depending on which study you, you read, 70 to 85 percent of all jobs are attained through networking. I've only been retired. I'm just shy of four years at post retirement. I'm already on job number five, and four of my five jobs were all through networking to include both of my roles here in CISA and my previous federal job at the Coast Guard. So, all that to say, that hands down is still, uh, you know, uh, a very, very powerful tool. You know, the resume still got to speak for itself, um, you know, and, and um, you know, to, to, to be even more competitive. But if you can get your name verbally into that hiring manager's ear from somebody else inside the organization, um, that's a huge leg up on competition. Um, so that's kind of general advice. So within CISA, uh, again, we have multiple hiring authorities or hiring vehicles, if you will. USA Jobs, that's the one everybody's most familiar with. Um, we also have another one we use called CTMS, uh, Charlie Tango, Mike Sierra. That is, that's a, it's actually a DHS run program, but CISA is like the only one that uses it. It stands for Cyber Talent Management System. And what it is, is we realize we can't compete with the likes of like Google and Microsoft and them as far as offering top tier talent, uh, the salaries that those other organizations can offer them. So what we're doing with CTMS is we're ditching the GS pay scale for a lot of our roles and we're going to pay bands. Um, so you're still a Fed, you still all, get all the benefits of being a Fed, but I mean, some of these pans go up, pay bands go upwards of 200K a year in salary. So huge opportunities there. Um, so CTMS, USA job. And then the last one is the one I spoke of earlier, which is the, the special hiring authorities, which really, you know, we get to break a lot of the OPM rules, if you will, I shouldn't say rules, but you know, it, it allows us to critically fill, uh, important roles, uh, very swiftly. So those are the ones we're going to use to, we're going to leverage to, to hire, you know, 30% or more VA disabled, which I forgot to mention before, there is a VREA hiring authority that we have, which that's for veterans that don't have 30% or more VA disability. Um, so we do leverage that sometimes where it's just veterans, 
uh, with any, you know, with or without VA disability, then there's a 30%. Um, and then again, we have the military spouse uh, hiring authority. And then there's there's uh, a couple others like student, if you're also a college student right now, we also have like student programs that we can actually hire you under those hiring authorities as well. Nice. Did that answer Thanks, your question? <laughs> okay. Yes, it did. Uh, what about that? All right. So, so as far as suburban propane, we do all our recruiting in house. Um, we have three recruiters currently. Uh, we have a great recruiting team. Um, like I said, we all cover different areas. We're we're nationwide, so we're in forty two different states. Um, so that that benefits us. You know, we go to hiring events. Uh, we go to on post hiring events, especially we're partnered with the Pays program, uh, trying to get partnered with the Skillbridge program currently. Um, so, you know, tips for for just kind of going through that process. Um, First thing, uh, if you if you schedule an interview with someone, you know, be be on time. Um, you know, it's not federal, but you know, you want to take every job seriously from the bottom to the top. Um, you know, Keith's saying he's been in four five different places. You never know how many times you're going to interview. Um, and, and and with that too, I would say doing research on the position you're applying for is something that I would recommend. Um, like for us, it's very simple. Uh, we have a careers website. As well as on our careers website, we have a you know a military our heroes hired here program um, where you can kind of do some research on what we do for veterans. Uh, we offer you know relocation allowance you know especially if you're transitioning uh, like I did I transitioned from Massachusetts to New Jersey. Um, the military paid for my move, but you know suburban propane also offered for me having to move here. Um, doing a little bit of research on your job uh, that you, that you're interested in, um, and you know you know resume does speak for itself. So that's one of the biggest things that I see as a recruiter is, is someone coming and transitioning out. Your resume just says, I was a soldier for three years. I was a soldier for 10 years. You know, Google's your best friend. Um, kind of find, you know, your job, see how it relates to the position and kind of uh, think about the skills you developed and, and add that to your resume. Always have that on there. So. Absolutely. That's great advice, Josh. Thank you. Alex? Yeah, um, I think my probably advice that hasn't kind of been covered already um, would be just to kind of ensure when you are, you know, going through the process of submitting an application, um, just, you know, kind of be cognizant of not only is it a position that you feel like confident that you'd be able to execute, right, but you know, you still have to be able to show, right? Regardless of that, you have to be able to show on your resume, right? How you meet the mandatory qualifications for the position. Um, and the job application process, although it is, you know, a lot more streamlined um, and, and certainly you can like import and parse a lot of information, it's still fairly labor intensive um, and it, it is time consuming. So I think you're far better served, you know, focusing on a handful of employers and focusing on a select few number of positions um, and really making sure like, okay, does my resume clearly articulate how I meet and exceed all of the necessary qualifications? Um, and I say that for a couple of reasons, right? Um, so one, it, it's better, you know, you, you don't want to um, essentially just, you know, um, spend a bunch of time applying to a bunch of random positions and then sit back and feel like, okay, mission accomplished, right? Um, and, and the other thing with that is that, you know, ideally speaking, you're going to be able to have points of contact with organizations, right? There's three here today, you know, two companies, uh, you know, federal government, right? Um, and then through, I've seen on the chat, you know, people are mentioning LinkedIn and, and things like that. And the networking piece was mentioned, um, but it kind of goes like twofold, right? So if you have points of contact, you have maybe even people that you like specifically know personally or professionally who are referring you to an organization, um, you know, it's even more important than <clears throat> to be providing them like the best version of yourself, right? The best resume, the resume that clearly shows how you meet the qualifications uh, because, you know, they're, you know, that referral or, you know, myself or, or any of the other, um, you know, recruiters or, or individuals that you're networking with, right? You know, we're like helping to market and promote you so you can help us help you, right, by making it clear how you, how you, uh, you know, you meet those qualifications. And then, you know, certainly if you're applying, right, and, and a recruiter is going to take a look at your resume, you just want to make it easy and as straightforward for them as possible 
to match you up against the qualifications, right? Um, so kind of either way, it makes sense to, to make sure that you're spending your time more like efficiently and effectively. Um, and I would really say like utilizing that networking piece and kind of tying it in with sort of, again, having a more targeted and focused approach with your applying, um, because you can always apply to more positions. You all can always like start looking at more companies and organizations, right? Um, but sometimes when you do the inverse and you start and you're just, you know, it's too much, too fast, too soon, um, and it can become kind of overwhelming and daunting. Um, so I, I really recommend like a slow ramp up period with going through that process um, so that it kind of becomes more, um, you know, kind of becomes second nature and things like that. Um, you know, and that's also good advice with, you know, setting up things like interviews and things like that, just the more acclimated and comfortable you are just with the process of, again, tailoring your resume, submitting an application, and that extends to things like interviews and speaking with recruiters and things like that, just the more comfortable you get and the more experience you have, um, the better you're going to be at it, right? Um, so, you know, it, it, and sometimes that is, is, it can honestly sometimes be even a benefit if you've been looking for a little bit because you're, you're kind of getting, you know, you're, you're getting better at it each time. Um, so, you know, it would really be my best advice is again, tailor your resume, be um, kind of aware of, okay, am I showing how I meet all the qualifications and starting with a more targeted uh, approach to the companies you're targeting, the organizations you're targeting, the people you're reaching out to um, so that it doesn't become, you know, just kind of too much, too overwhelming um, and too much going on at once to be able to really focus on the, the right position for you. Absolutely. And you guys all mentioned networking, right? And someone have, has asked a question in the Q&A section, so I want to go over that. Uh, anybody who wants to answer this, just feel free to jump in uh, on our panel and, and just pick up the question. But um, networking is very powerful, which they've also stated and, and we all agree with. But, you know, as a recruiter being in the recruiting space, we get a ton of messages right on LinkedIn and sometimes it can just be someone that says you know I want to work for your company how do I where do I here's my resume where do I fit in which probably is not the best idea um, and we can go over that a little bit but someone's asking what is the best way to communicate that your intent is to work for that organization and that you're trying to network within it right is there a strategy is there like suggestions on wording I know we want to avoid in messaging someone and saying, here's my resume, where do I fit within your company? But what advice do you guys have to answer this question around how expressing that intent to, to who you're trying to network with? There's nothing more frustrating than just sending out empty connections, right? Um, how, how do people get a leg up? I would say just be honest. And, and I'll let the other two gentlemen probably expand on that more. Just Just be honest. Hey, I'm looking to network, you know, networking is nothing more than building relationship. Um, what I want to actually speak to on that and, and maybe take it from a different angle is who you network with. You can network with me all day long as a recruiter, right? I'm a recruiter. I talk to the hiring managers, but that hiring manager doesn't necessarily know me from Adam, right? So this is a 3000 plus person organization. I'm not going to know every single hiring manager. I'm not going to have re a relationship with every single hiring manager. So all that to say, yeah, I can push your resume forward all day long and say, this looks like a really strong resume, but that's not a referral, right? That's not that that word of mouth that's going to give you a leg up necessarily. So what I encourage you to do is find those organizations, like uh, um, Alex was saying, find those organizations that you want to work for, maybe five, no more than like seven, because then it gets overwhelming. Find like five that you want to work for and go to LinkedIn, right? Look up those organizations. Any sizable organization today has a LinkedIn page. And below that organization name, it has a little hyperlink that says X number of employees work here. Click on it. Start going through that list. Who works in the exact or similar role that you want to work in? Start clicking on their name. Start reaching out to them. Those are the folks I would encourage you to network with. Because again, as a recruiter, that's cool. You got me on the inside possibly. But if you can get somebody else on the inside who hopefully would know that hiring manager or have some sort of connection to who the hiring manager might be, their recommendation is going to hold so much more water because they have clout with that hiring manager. Um, even if they're not willing to endorse you because they don't know you that well, right? You're not going to know every single person in your network that well. You don't know all your Facebook friends that well, probably, right? Um, but just for them to just throw your name out there. I used to be a hiring manager. I have six years of hiring manager experience. And the best hires I ever made were word of mouth referrals. Even if they weren't an endorsement, just hearing their name, I'm going to tell the recruiter to pull your packet. 
Um, you know, and, and as long as your resume is not garbage, you're probably going to at least get an interview with me. Um, so yeah, that'd be my advice. Recruiters are great, but really target the people that are doing the jobs you want to do. Get on, get, get on the horn with them, learn from them, network with them. I think that's going to be the most impactful way. I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> that was great advice. Anybody else? Oh, Josh. Yeah, I, I think King, Keith banged it right on, on the nail on the head or however that expression goes. Um, but it, honestly, networking isn't just LinkedIn as well. Um, you know, face to face, like for us, we're, we're like I said, we're, we're everywhere. So you may see our drivers if you're a driver or you're interested in driving and you see our driver or any driver for any company. Say you're at a gas station getting gas and you see one of those big, the big rigs pull up to, to kind of fill it up. You're a driver, maybe go over to the driver and say, hey, bud, can you know talk to you? See, it, you know, obviously you don't want to want to bug them, but you know, that network and that face-to-face, -face, um, you know, that gets back. Plenty of our referrals are, are from our drivers telling the hiring manager, hey, this guy came up to, to me at the gas station. Uh, this person came, you know, he came to my, I delivered to his home and his brother um, was there and he, he came out and talked to me. He has a CDL or he's interested in getting a CDL. Um, you know, we have apprentice programs here. I, I know a lot of companies, you know, I don't know if they do it. I know apprenticeships are, are more popular now than they were in the past. Um, so they do all the training in-house uh, because with companies now, they want to build you from inside. We love to, to promote from inside, but if you bring someone in, you teach them the skills that they don't have and especially with, with, you know, veterans, you know, we all can say, you know, you guys, we're the most driven, you know, you're going to be at the right place at the right time in the right uniform. And that's, if you're learning, that's really what you need to do. Um, so yeah, yeah, to that, that point, networking with the, the people who are actually doing the job. And, and if you are on LinkedIn, uh, I know for Suburban, all of our hiring managers are on LinkedIn, and we get a lot of hiring managers, hey, this guy reached out to me not just the recruiter, because you can see the talent acquisition partner or the recruiter and say, hey, here's my resume, but I have 50 people like that. The hiring manager may, maybe has 10, 12, maybe the driver has zero. So, you know, like I said, Keith banged around on the, on the nail. Absolutely. Yeah, okay, so next question. I have another question. Um, <laughs> so you guys have talked about hiring managers, recruiters, you know, all these different roles within an organization. So as we kind of get prepared for our virtual career fair coming up, so if you guys haven't registered, make sure you get registered. We will put another link in there um, on the 22nd from 12 to 4. But, you know, what should those expectations be going into a virtual hiring event? Like, you know, you have recruiters in the booth, you may or may not have hiring managers. What are those expectations? Are they going to go in and get hired once they talk to a recruiter? Are they going to be encouraged to go apply? Like, what are next steps or what should, you know, those expectations be for someone who's going to a virtual career event? Yeah, this, um, this is a great question. Um, and this kind of um, matches up with what I was just going to suggest with the, the previous question as well. Um, so, you know, when you're looking at a specific, you know, employer, right, um, what I was going to suggest with, you know, networking on LinkedIn and things like that is that you can certainly like reach out to, you know, you can reach out to anybody like unsolicited on LinkedIn, right? Um, and I mean, if you have a particular skill set that a recruiter is like, you know, needs at that particular time, and you happen to reach out to them, um, then yeah, you, you know, you may be able to strike up that that conversation. Um, but what I would recommend is to, you know, use LinkedIn, right, certainly connect and follow people within the, the military community who are providing good uh, advice. Uh, there's been, you know, in the chat, there's been discussion of some programs um, that can help with obtaining like certifications and things like that and training programs. Um, there's a wealth of information on, you know, just on LinkedIn, let alone if you just go to a, you know, search engine and, and search it out. Um, but I would utilize that to kind of help in your search and who you want to target, right? So to kind of segue to the question about the, you know, the, the virtual hiring fair coming up is really come prepared, right? You know, ideally with specific, you know, specifics, um, you know, with us, it's, you know, we on our website, right, we probably have somewhere like 26, 2700 jobs posted. We also have a number of subsidiaries. So when you kind of add all those up, you know, we have over 3000 jobs available, um, you know, nationwide to, and, and worldwide, honestly. But um, coming with specifics, right? So specifics, not just about your background and being able to speak 
um, you know, to your background and, um, you know, what you've done in the service or, or what you've done, you know, post-military, but also to be able to have specific opportunities that you've identified um, or at the very least competency areas within a company, um, you know, that you're interested in, right? So it certainly helps if you come to, to Lidos and you say, hey, you know, Alex, I'm, you know, I'm interested in this specific opportunity. You know, this is, you know, my background, you know, I have applied or, you know, I'm planning to apply here and, you know, later today, you know, that's great. Um, but even broader than that, you know, if it, if it is just, you know, like a skill area or a specific type of work, you know, that we do, um, you know, then that's very helpful as well. Um, but just coming prepared, um, I think Josh mentioned about doing your research uh, earlier, you know, just coming prepared, having done your research on those companies that are attending, uh, on those organizations that are attending, and then just coming prepared with some specifics to speak about. Um, because I'll tell you a good way to probably not use your time the most effectively is to come to a virtual or even in-person event, right? And then just say like, what do you do or what do you have for me? Um, because, you know, you're not really giving that specific recruiter or manager, you know, that much that's actionable, right? Um, whereas if you come and say, hey, here's a position, here's how I'm qualified, you know, can you give me some feedback on it? You know, that, that allows you to speak to something specific and for you to leave as a job seeker with, you know, a, a better sense of kind of, um, you know, what's going on with that particular role or, or where you might fit, um, as opposed to asking more like open-ended type questions, um, you know, especially when you're talking to, to a larger company or, you know, an organization that maybe has a lot of different uh, areas that, that, you know, you could potentially consider. Um, so those would be my suggestions kind of moving into the, to the hiring fair here later this month. Awesome. Thank you. That's a lot of great information. Um, <laughs> a lot of great things that we can continue to branch off on and talk to and talk about. But Jess, I have another question, right, on that same, in that same kind of line. Um, but as individuals are getting ready for the career fair and, and they're preparing and they're doing their research and, and looking at companies, do you think it's beneficial for them to, in your opinion, Josh, uh, apply for a position ahead of the career fair? Or should they wait and do it afterwards? So, so applying definitely shows that that initiative and you know that you know tells the the interviewer if it's a hiring manager, recruiter, or who, whoever is attending that you're you're interested in the position. And that's kind of one of the things going into a, a virtual hiring event, especially you don't know if you know the person's really interested. Are they just here to listen? Are they here to just gather information, or do they really want the job? Um, so applying definitely shows that you you want the job. Um, and like for us, like I said, we recruit in-house. As soon as you get that application, you may be contacted before the hiring event even starts. Um, but but yeah, I, I definitely would recommend applying because even if they don't have like in, you know, a recruiting team that's, you know, monitoring that every day, um, when you're in the, you know, the hiring event, you can say, hey, well, yeah. I, and they tell you, oh, you, you sound great. You know, can you go to our, our website and apply? You're, oh, it's already done. So yeah, definitely a plus. Awesome. Great. But you brought up another good point. You guys are so, this is great. This is, the conversation is awesome. Um, but you brought up a point about, you know, them contacting you ahead of time, right? So with virtual career fairs, you guys have the option to upload your resume ahead of the event. Um, and this gives the recruiters, the attendees, the hiring managers, the opportunity to look at your resume um, and schedule a time with you, right? Or schedule, you know, an interview or, or even just reach out to ask you some questions. So if you haven't done so already, if you're registered, go ahead and upload your resume because it's super important. Um, you may actually get a call ahead of the perfect. Um, so the next question, as we prepare and do our research in corporate espionage, right? Looking at the employers, the jobs they have, you know, the positions, the culture, all that kind of stuff. Key. This question's for you and your new role as a recruiter. Um, what kind of espionage do you do on the job seeker, right? Are you looking for LinkedIn profiles? Are you looking at Facebook? What do you look at? Um, what, I, what should our figures be mindful of? Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, 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 please. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to your LinkedIn, 100%. Um, and I want to see a digital brand, right? Uh, Cybersecurity, especially because I, you know, that's that's my niche right now, and I can speak to that, right? Cybersecurity is a, a hot industry, right? Pay is good. Everybody's trying to pivot into it, and yeah, I don't blame them, but they're trying to pivot into it from maybe doing something completely different in the military, which isn't a bad thing. 
but you've got to reinvent yourself. And folks, you know, so many times I'll go to their LinkedIn profile and their LinkedIn profile is either empty or it's not even it's the posts and stuff like that. The interactions aren't anything regarding the new industry that they're trying to pivot into, right? So that, that digital brand, I want to see that you are active, especially in cybersecurity. It's a way of life with these folks, right? I'm not a cyber guy uh, myself, uh, uh, but I, you know, my previous role within CISA, my boss, I supported a hacker team. And um, and yeah, my boss was like, you're going to learn the language, you're going to learn what they do. So all that to say, I've learned a lot about these guys. And it's like a way of life. Like they're they're doing what's called bug bounties and all kinds of like others capture the flags and the cyber events like in their free time because they just love it. Um, so all that to say, that's kind of what, at least what I'd be looking for. Are you living the life? Are you like, are you engaged in the community? Because again, cyber, especially it's like the medical field. It is constantly changing. You've got to stay up to date. There's new vulnerabilities all the time. you got to know what they are. you got to know how to combat them or prevent them or patch them, whatever. And all that to say, so I just want to see that you're active in the industry. Um, Facebook, personally, I, I don't, I'm probably not, I'm not, I'm not even on Facebook. So I'd have to use like my wife's Facebook account to stalk you if I want to do there. Um, you know, uh, so I'm not, I don't worry myself too much there. Um, you know, I, I don't like Facebook, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, I know I, well, and I should say, I know other hiring managers that, that do though, and they're just going to look for, you know, any negativity, just stay, you know, social media, stay away from negativity. Don't be, you know, getting into political debates and all those other crazy things where people get all heated and, and negative. So be positive and be active, be active in your community of whatever industry you're trying to pivot into to show me that you truly are invested in this industry. And this is really what you want to do. Cause just like you're, you're saying you want to come work for me. I want to make sure you want to come work for me because retention is a huge thing, right? That, that's, you know, re, you know, it costs way more money to, to hire somebody else and bring them on and all that other stuff than it does to treat people right, train them right and keep them in your organization. And this is actually huge on that. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it with that. Thanks, Keith. That's great advice. And, you know, I think a lot of times we forget that, right? That companies are very focused on retaining their talent because the cost to hire new talent is very high. Uh, so if you're currently with an organization and you're trying to make a career change, you know, look to partnerships and things like that to help, uh, kind of get you down that path. So on the note of resumes, right, if, if I was to ask 20,000 people their opinion on resumes, I'm sure I'd get 20,000 different answers, right? Um, but as far as some of the things that could uh, help you in your journey to avoid some of the technology that's attached to some of the systems that we use to scrub resumes, um, any advice that anyone, any of our panelists, Alex, if, if you want to jump in, um, I think you were pretty passionate about this this question last time we had a panel and we gave some awesome advice. But you know, in that resume, what kind of things can someone do to help avoid the auto scrubbers or to help avoid some of the AI tech that's used uh, to help them get through the hiring process? Like, should they include a picture on the resume, not a picture, traditional formatting, dates? Anything on there, best practices that you would recommend to help or things to avoid? Yeah, um, this is another great question. So kind of in, in, in my experience, um, you know, my career has all been in, in defense and government contracting. Um, so really, you're kind of just looking at like a, a by the basics approach, right? Um, so having a resume that is... Um, you know, essentially something that can be easily parsed and fed into like an applicant tracking system. Uh, a good way to probably check that is if you're using like, um, if you're setting up like a LinkedIn profile, for example, or something like that, and you want to pull information from your resume and kind of see how it aligns. Um, you know, the initial time where you're like uploading your resume to like our system, um, you know, there, there may be some things that you kind of need to tweak. But ideally, you make it, you know, again, like as kind of efficient as possible for kind of taking that information. Uh, the best way to kind of do that is sort of have a what I recommend having is, you know, you have your initial contact information up top. You basically have a, a summary of your qualifications. 
Um, you know, a lot of times I'll find that individuals will include like an objective statement. And this is included in a lot of formats that are, you know, provided to you either professionally or there's, there's companies um, and nonprofits that kind of help with resumes. Um, you know, I would say take that objective statement and craft it more towards kind of a, a summary or um, kind of uh, the specific qualifications that make you best qualified for that particular position. Um, and then really have sort of a reverse chronological order of your experience, right? Um, to include like months and uh, months and years um, that you can kind of break down. Um, you know, there I don't really subscribe to like a specific page limit. You know, you'll generally hear like, don't go, you know, keep it to two pages or less. I mean, if, if you go on to like a third page or something like that, it, it's not a deal breaker. Um, to be honest with you, your general recruiter, right? who's looking at your resume for a handful of seconds, right? They're gonna look at um, your summary of qualifications and how it aligns to the requirements for the position. Um, probably maybe they'll drop down and take a look at, um, at your kind of recent experience just to kind of see like a, a quick career progression. Um, and a lot of the times, depending on if the positions, you know, um, like in person, they're gonna look at where you're physically located. Um, so keep that in mind too, right? If you are planning or able to relocate yourself um, and you have a residence or you, you know, can put that location that, you know, for the position that you're considering, um, you know, I'd recommend doing that or just make it clear that you're able to relocate. Um, because again, like um, just making it as easy as possible, right? I mean, uh, you know, if a recruiter sees two candidates that are, you know, absolutely equal, but one is located, you know, where the position is and the other is on the different coast, right? They're probably just gonna gravitate towards, you know, what's easier, right? Um, so just kind of like, keep that in mind. There's just little things that you can do to kind of, again, or better position yourself. Um, but to Kayla's point, right? You definitely do not and should not, you know, include a picture. Uh, you don't need to really put like things like hobbies, um, you don't really necessarily need to list every single, you know, military award or certification. Um, try to keep it germane to sort of the position that you're applying for. Um, certainly there are positions that are going to specifically call out some military training and certifications and things like that. And that you absolutely want to include. Um, I mean, there's more I could get into, but it's really like reviewing the job description because there are certainly job descriptions that are written more in military terminology where you may want to even include like your MOS or something like that, because that's something they're going to quickly, you know, do a quick keyword search for because um, it's, it's very specific to that role. Right. Um, but there are often times where a position is going to be more kind of generalized and there you want to kind of pull out, okay, you know, let me kind of write towards what the, uh, the job description is listing. Um, and the last thing I'll say uh, is don't use things like tables or anything like that. Um, you know, within like a, you know, use a Microsoft Word or uh, Adobe if you have to. Um, and then just, you know, like I said, make sure that you're not using tables or anything that can kind of make the parsing feature uh, kind of messy when that information is getting imported. Um, and then, you know, from there, ideally, you're just focusing on that overall summary in the top like quarter or third of your page that you're really tweaking and tailoring to the um, positions that you're applying for. Um, and that's definitely gonna include things like, you know, specific certifications that are necessary for the, the job, absolutely like your security clearance, education, uh, you know, maybe a summary of your years of experience and things like that. Um, but try to keep it like short and to the point um, and you don't necessarily need to load it up with, um, you know, some like intangibles and soft skills, right? Because uh, those are all things that you can kind of get across when you get to that interview. Um, and that's where you're really going to be selling your soft skills. You're going to be selling your personality you're going to be selling yourself, right? Because they've already determined you're, you're you know, you're, you're a fit on paper, right? Um, the resume is really just about how do you match up, you know, per, you know, per, um, you know, qualification to your experience and things like that. Thanks, Alex. That was a lot of information, great information. You always have such good responses, Alex. All right, um, I think Keith, you wanted to jump in. Federal agencies are a little different, right? They may not have the same resources as private organizations. So yeah, um, I was... having audio covers or AI may not really be a thing, but 
yeah to that point so yeah i was actually gonna back out because he he he, he kind of hit everything i was gonna hit anyway just without saying it uh directly so yeah like sis we don't have an ats we don't have a scrubber we don't actually have all of that like you send us our resume it is getting looked at by human eyes only um so all that to say, it doesn't change anything is really what I wanted to say, though. So I because I've met folks are like they find out, oh, SISA or whoever they don't, you know, they don't use, you know, uh, an algorithm, you know, thing to scrub and look for keywords and buzzwords. But at the end of the day, even if it's just a recruiter reviewing it, it's the same exact concept that recruiter is looking for those same buzzwords and keywords and everything else. So it's still got to be there. Tell your resume to every single job description. Um, that's why, yeah, if somebody's like, oh, I sent out 50 resumes this week. Well, you're not getting a call back for a single one for an interview because clearly you didn't tailor it. It's not going to contain the meat uh, and the, the nece necessary ingredients, if you will, that uh, we need for it to be an impactful resume to get you onto the interview stage. So, um, so yeah, yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on that. Really, everything Alex said, it goes regardless of what organization, even if you know what system they're using to, to handle resumes and track candidates, it, it, everything still applies. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, someone has typed in a question in the Q&A, and I want to get to that because it's a good one. So when it comes to virtual hiring events, um, the waiting time for chats can be extended, right? There's a lot of people in these events, um, and they can get pretty crowded. So while you're waiting in line, or if you get cut off before the you know event closes and there's no time left, what advice do you guys have Um for those who are attending the event and want to discuss a, discuss a role with that individual, but the lines are long, they may not be able to get in for a chat. How do they get around this? I, I would say, you know, generally uh, with the virtual hiring events, the recruiters have an email um, that's associated that they like put on like a profile or they'll have like a little uh, snippet about themselves. Uh, generally, from my experience, I would say if you can't wait, um, just because when it comes to those lines, it's really not up to us. Uh, it's just kind of how the, the hiring event is when people join into your booth. Uh, generally, it's like a queue. So we can't like, I, I, sometimes you can skip ahead, sometimes you can't. Um, but, but generally, you know, it's kind of whoever came into the booth first is kind of who they get to. I, I would say definitely reach out by an email with a follow up if, if you can't wait. Um, you know, that's just, that's, that's the best advice I can give. Cause um, generally after a hiring event, that's the first thing I check is my emails um, or, you know, LinkedIn, you know, messages just to make sure someone from the hiring event didn't reach out to me because maybe the wait was too long or an emergency came up. They popped in to get the email and the contact and had to leave because of, you know, an emergency or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And so we have like, 13 minutes left, right? And I, I want to get to the interview. We, we've had such a good conversation. Thank you guys for everything. Um, but when we get to the interview stage, right? So we've, you know, had chat, we've applied, we've been asked to come in for an interview. What are some of the common questions um, that you could find in a first interview that the response that you have to that could be a bit unique to help set you apart, right? So common question, unique response. Um, during the interview process. And whoever wants to jump in can jump in. Three, two, one. So stop. common question, <laughs> I, I know, uh, you know, generally even like movies, TV shows you hear, where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, generally, um, I, I would ask a question back to that. Um, you know, you know, what goals does the company have? Um, I, I know for myself, I was the, you know, Two, I applied to 200 jobs. I tailored 50 different resumes and cover letters and stuff like that. So, so it, it was, you know, kind of hectic for me. Uh, I got out during the pandemic uh, medically, so it was kind of an involuntary thing. So it was just like, hey, you're in the job market now. Um, so well, you, you, that's one of like the big questions that you you see all the time. I know uh, my, you know, when we do like our corporate interviews, we, we say that because we've been around 95 years um, of suburban propane, and and we don't tend to go anywhere within the next five years. So, so generally you always want to ask, you know, when they ask where you see yourself in five years, you know, you always want to just say, you don't want to say, I, I see myself being your boss. You know, you, you want to be like, you know, I want to see uh, growth in myself. I want to be at the next level of this position. Um, you know, we, we love to promote, you know, within the company. So uh, you start out as a driver, a technician, or a customer service rep. They ask you, hey, you know, where do you want to be? You know, maybe I want to be an office manager, a driver. Maybe I want to be a tech you know, technicians, maybe I want to be a regional or, or, you know, 
a level three tech or something like that and ask what steps that the company does to help you get to that point. You know, it's a little weird. It's, it's unique to ask questions to that question. Um, but I, I tend to, it, it, it shows me that you're involved and that, that you're interested in learning more instead of just kind of answering that question the same for every company. You know what I mean? Absolutely. That's a great way to set yourself apart, right? And also to show that you're engaged, like Keith said earlier, and that you're eager to, to learn more about the company. You brought up cover letters. <laughs> All right. So, yes, Keith, there you go. Um, opinion on cover letters. Do we do them? Do we not? And on top of that, following up, right? Do we send a thank you note? Do we send a LinkedIn message? How do we follow up? And do we use a cover letter? Alex is off mute too. Can I, can I jump on this, Alex? Go ahead. I'm passionate about this one. Okay. Yes, 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 and yes. As long as you do it the right way. Oh my God, people do it the wrong way all the time. So I am an absolute advocate for cover letters when they're done properly. However, most people don't do them properly. A cover letter is not an extension of your resume. It is not a duplication or reproduction of your resume. Okay. It is not. They are two separate entities. All right. The best way I can explain it, and as succinctly as I can explain it, is the resume is your how, right? The resume is going to tell me how you are the best fit for the job. The cover letter is your why. It's going to tell me why you're the best fit to the job. It's going to tell me what your values are, what your morals are, and how they align with my organization. Again, kind of that passion thing, right? It's going to tell me you, you as a person, why do I want to hire you as a person kind of thing. Resume is going to give me all the facts, all the data, all the experiences that that cover letter is going to show me a little bit more of who you are and in and, and that insight into you and how that lines up with our organization. So that means you got to do your homework, right? What is that organization's value? What are their uh, what's their mission statement? That, that sort of thing. And how does that embolden you or invigorate you to want to come work for us kind of thing? Um, so that's yeah, that's that's huge. Uh, I, I love that question because I'm like, because I keep reading these posts and, and articles that cover letters are dead and. And they are the way people are using them. If you do the why, everybody that has that opinion, every time I've come to that why versus how I've described it that way, they've all turned on their opinion and said, well, yeah, if they do, if they do it that way, then yeah, I, I, I would totally accept a, a cover letter. Um, follow up. Yeah, I advocate for that as well. Uh, thank you letters, handwritten. I, I am a big advocate. Get a thank you card, handwrite it, hand sign it, the whole shebang. And then, yeah, you might not have their mailing address, but, you know, I, I literally scan them in digitally and email them to the to the hiring panel or the hiring manager, whoever it might be. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that just shows that ever le extra level of commitment uh, and, and appreciation, really. And, you know, and at the end, I always tell folks, just put, you know, hey, I, you know, I wish you the best of luck in your difficult decision or your difficult selection, whatever. Don't, don't, you know, yeah, because. You've already interviewed, you've already, your resume, all that stuff's already done, right? So your, your chances to be confident, all right, maybe a little bit cocky even are, are kind of, you know, you've had that chance. So now let's be a little humble and say, you know what? I put my best foot forward, best of luck in your decision. And, uh, and I, you know, I wish you the best in your, your you know, when, in, in what happens with that. So, all right, I'll shut up now. I love it. Stay humble. Alex, did you have something to add? Um, sure. Um, so just really briefly, you know, kind of in, in my industry, um, to be honest with you, it's really all about tailoring your resume. And, you know, when you're including an application to this specific uh, opportunity, um, as far as like, you don't really need to include a specific cover letter. Um, I will say, you know, if you're reaching out maybe directly like to a hiring manager, um, you may want to, in that case, you know, I can tell you basically from like a recruiting perspective, most recruiters are just going to go to that resume and say, do you qualify? Okay. You know, I'm going to pass you along to the hiring manager because they're managing, you know, 50, 60, 70 requisitions. They have hundreds of applicants for each position. Right. So, um, but you know, again, if, if you've kind of developed a rapport, maybe with a manager, um, or you can just kind of include what you may want to include in a cover letter, just in that initial email, um, you know, where you're reaching out. Um, and then I think you also asked about, you know, a follow-up, absolutely send a follow-up. Like if, if you get to an interview and, you know, you absolutely want to include a, uh, you know, a follow-up, a thank you from the interview um, and to the best you're able to at the end of an interview, right? 
determine like a timeline for when you can expect to hear back so that you give yourself a timeline of when it's like appropriate to start following up, right? Um, because if, if you end an interview, you think it went well, company's like, yeah, we'll get back to you. And it's been a week, two weeks. And then you're just, you're, you're not, you, you got, am I supposed to reach out? You know, is it? So try to give like, you know, end it with like when you can expect to hear back um, so that that at least gives you like a timeline of, okay, when is it appropriate to start reaching out and getting some feedback, right? Um, because, you know, things happen and a company may, you know, you may be like a great fit for that company, but, you know, um, you know, there's people involved in, in every step of the process. So the, you know, having that kind of firm timeline of when to follow up is certainly helpful and absolutely just reaching out and, and sending a thank you and sending that follow up post interview, I would certainly recommend. Absolutely. Okay, so we have another question in the Q&A. Someone's asked how, so they, I guess there's uh, some purpose behind this, what recruiters do and what recruiters, what people think recruiters do and what recruiters really do, right? So how many interviews, um, and this is just a quick question, we only have five minutes left, we'll get back to the other ones, but I want to answer this one. How many interviews are conducted in a week, just on average? For, for myself, I, you know, I, I conduct, I would say 20 in a week. Uh, and that's phone interviews, uh, scheduling in-person interviews that can be anywhere from, from 20 to 30, just depending on how, how much we're hiring. That's a lot, right? On top of having to look through a ton of resumes. Keith and Alex, how many do you guys, how many interviews do you guys do a week? Uh, I'll say zero because that's only my second week on the job. So, <laughs> uh, but for like, so, but my peers, I've talked to them um, and honestly, CISA are hiring methods again, because my team, we're not the guys, we, we don't handle USA jobs. We don't handle CTMS. We don't handle any of those. My team is only special hiring authorities. So those job openings aren't as, there's not nearly as many of those as there are just regular USA job uh, and, and CTMS openings. So all that to say, I know my folks, they don't do as many interviews either because we don't have, we're not handling as many job openings with all those special hiring authorities. But I'd say probably, especially our social media recruiter, Sasha, who I, I put her LinkedIn earlier in the chat, um, she probably does at least 10 a week, I would say. She, she does quite a few. That's a lot. I think it adds up over time, right? And that's 30 you know, a month, you know, what, 90 a quarter. Um, so it's a lot. But so someone has asked, what, asked, and I think we might not have had the opportunity to touch on this, and we have three minutes left, so we got to keep our answers quick so we can get to the good, you know, so we can get them all the best employees we can. But um, self-ID, right? Someone has asked, you know, do they put whether or not they have a qualifying disability on their resume? Um, and I want to go back to self ID and what that is and why it's important um, and, and how that can kind of align with, with the question that they're asking. So whoever wants to jump in, feel free to jump in. Uh, I know with self ID, uh, a lot of states, they have a hiring, a veteran hiring preference, uh, especially with disabled veteran hire, hiring preference as well. Uh, so, so some companies, you know, they, they may not be involved. I, I know like from, uh, you know, suburban propane, we, we do. So uh, that's just why we keep track of it. We also keep track of all of our veterans because we have our, our Heroes Hired Here program where, like I said, we have that relocation incentive. We have, um, you know, a, a mentorship where we have, you know, someone in the position you're coming into reach out to you that is a veteran. Um, and I reach out directly every time. Uh, and uh, we also for reservists as well when they're uh, acti activated to active duty status and they're deployed somewhere, uh, suburban propane, we, we send care packages. So companies may do stuff like that as well, so. It's a great point. There's a lot of good programs and incentives within organizations. And, you know, a lot of times if you don't have that experience on your resume, you can opt in during the self-ID part and it may help fast track you through the application process um, or through the hiring process. So we have about two minutes left. Um, last question. What advice do you have to our attendees today uh, to help them on their journey? Um, I'll go. So, you know, because I do a lot of mentorship on the side as well. So just in general transition, really, what I'm so that's where I'm going to come from is just my secret formula to transition, right? Because um, after years of mentorship and my own transition, which was terrifying in and of itself, 
um, the, the, the secret form, and this is very high level, obviously, obviously there's, there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, intricacies to this, but the, there's three things you got to do to be a successful transition knee or transitioner or whatever you want to call it. Um, one is find a mentor, find 10, build a board of advisors. A mentor is defined as someone who has your best interest at heart, but is not impressed by you. Okay. Build it, build a team like that. Let them help, you know, bounce ideas off of and guide you along the way. Second is leverage every single resource you can get your hands on. Onward opportunity, hire heroes USA, USO uh, Pathfinders, uh, GI, GI jobs, right? Uh, American corporate partners. There are over 147,000 nonprofits registered with the IRS just for veterans. That's almost overwhelming. Those mentors can help you guide wade through that sea of goodwill, right? Uh, and then the last thing is just don't give up. Is 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 easier said than done, right? Uh, it's it can you're going to fail, you're going to have challenges, it's going to happen. Pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and keep going. You do those three things at a high level over, over uh, or a yeah, high level uh, overview, you're gonna you're gonna succeed. You're gonna be just fine in your transition. Yeah, um, just really quick, I would say just you know the the job search in general, like it is, it's. With the technology that's in place, it's easier than ever to like apply to a job from your phone from like anywhere in the world. Um, you know, so just keep in mind like the volume of applicants that the companies are receiving. And like I can say from a Lido's perspective, we put a lot of like resources into getting our jobs like, you know, all over the web and, and so that you could just, you know, find them, you know, anywhere. Um, you know, but that does lead right to, to a lot of competition. Um, and just understand that it's it's never personal so that if you feel like frustrated or you're not hearing back or something like that, um, you know, recruiters, recruiters want to fill positions, right? They want to get positions filled. That's literally like their job and and what they're being compensated to do. Um, and they don't want to have, you know, more and more requisitions, you know, getting added to, to the, um, you know, to the to their daily um their daily schedule. So just keep in mind, it, you know, it's never, it's never personal, you know, and always keep things professional and to Keith's point, you know, be diligent and don't get discouraged and, and continue to, you know, and if you're trying the same thing over and over again, you know, switch it up, say, okay, you know what, I'm going to try getting out to more events in person. I'm going to try, you know, a different approach to how I follow up and stuff like that. Um, there's no like one, you know, specific way that I can say, well, this is how you get a job. There's best practices and they're best practices for a reason, but each person's journey will be a little bit different. Um, so, you know, switch things up, you know, and, and if you are more of a people person, you know, get out, there's plenty of events you can attend in person um, and, and, you know, use some different resources and some different avenues, um, you know, but really kind of stay, stay dedicated, uh, treat it as like a full-time job um, because it really is. Um, and then, like I said, just, you know, kind of, kind of um, keep at it and, and um, should you land that opportunity, right? you know, do your best to pay it forward, you know, share what worked for you, share with, you know, your friends, your colleagues, just share on LinkedIn, hey, this is how I found my role. Um, you know, all that is, all that anecdotal, uh, you know, evidence and information can be helpful. Um, so just some of my advice. Thank you, Alex. So I want to say thank you to everyone that has attended today. We really, really appreciate you taking the time to, you know, talk with us, ask questions, engage. Um, hope that you guys have already registered for the career fair. If you haven't already, we'll put a link in the chat again. There has been a ton of chatter in the chat with a lot of great resources and websites and everything. So go ahead and, you know, make sure that you absorb all of that. Connect on LinkedIn uh, with our panelists today, as well as myself. We'd love to help you in any way that we can. Um, you've had great advice and, you know, if you guys need anything, feel free to reach out. There's lots of resources out there that we can also help connect you with. Uh, thank you again for attending. Thank you so much to our panelists. You guys are fabulous. Um, so much good information. Can't wait to have you guys on again um, and finish asking all the other questions that we didn't get to. <laughs> Thanks, guys. It was an honor as always. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Made the first one easy for me. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.